Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Eveling, and it is March 22nd. Today we celebrate a journal entry about spring and sap and microclimates. We'll also learn about a young Dutch botanist who determined the cause of Dutch elm disease. We'll hear a poem about spring from a beloved English poet, and we grow that garden library today with a book about the garden from a man who was never in a hurry, who fought to preserve trees, and sought to work with nature. And then we'll wrap things up with the story of the earliest horticulture society in the United States. But first, Here's today's curated news. Today's curated news was inspired by a post that listener Stephanie Byrne shared in the Facebook group for the show. She sent a picture that showed a beautiful swath of blooming iris, and she wrote, Here's a lovely presentation of ancient white bearded irises thanks to the efforts of a long-ago gardener in Norwood, Georgia. Well, this photo drew a response from listener Adrian Williams, who commented, Cemetery whites, beautiful. Well, I had not heard of that term, cemetery whites, and so I asked Adrian to share a little bit more about this term. And she wrote, In the South, cemetery whites is a term that we use for these particular irises. At one point, they were the most common iris planted here, and we find them everywhere, especially on old home sites and cemeteries. In fact, there's a little old cemetery near my house that the caretaker has allowed me to take a few plants and cuttings from, and he let me take home my own cemetery whites. They're just just as beautiful and hardy as can be, and they always seem to bloom a lot earlier than the other irises. Well, I replied back to Adrian that as she was telling me this story, I was immediately thinking that they must be very, very hardy. And so it was great to hear her say that. And so today, when I was picking the article that I wanted to share with you, I found a very lovely post about cemetery whites that was written in a New Orleans publication back in 2017. And the title is The Hunt for a White Iris, Once Popular in Old New Orleans Gardens. And this post was written by their garden columnist, Dan Gill. Now, in this article, a listener had written in asking for help locating a white iris that he remembered growing in old New Orleans gardens in the 1950s. And Dan replied with this response, You're likely looking for iris albicans. It goes by a variety of different names, including the white cemetery iris. It's native to Yemen and was commonly planted on graves in Muslim regions, hence the common name. Now, Dan mentions that he's also heard this iris referred to as white flag. And then he shared this adorable little anecdote. He said he once stopped by a country gardener that he met, and he was admiring this planting of iris in her yard. And she said, I call them rags on a stick which Dan remarks is actually fairly descriptive of the large, somewhat floppy white flowers on their sturdy stems. Well, I loved this article from Dan, and I want to give another quick shout out to Adrian and Stephanie for bringing this iris to my attention. Now, if you would like to read Dan's post for yourself or even track down Stephanie's post, all you need to do is the next time you're in the Facebook group for the show, just head on over to the little magnifying glass and type in the word iris and these posts will pop right up. And if you're not in the Facebook group, 
Don't worry about it. You can join at any time. It's 100% free. The next time you're on Facebook, just head on up to the search bar, type in Daily Gardener Community, or you'd search for a friend and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for March 22nd. Today, Henry David Thoreau wrote about spring and flowing sap in maple trees in his journal. And he also wrote about microclimates. And you'll notice that when he does that, he calls them warm places, or he uses the word warm as an adjective to describe the little microclimate. Anyway, here's what he wrote on this day, March 22nd, in 1856. Part of the white maples now begin to flow, some perhaps two or three days. Probably in equally warm positions, they would have begun to flow as early as those red ones, which I have tapped. The sap is now generally flowing upward in red and white maples in warm positions. See it flow from maple twigs, which were gnawed off by rabbits in the winter. The down of willow catkins in warm places has peeped out an eighth of an inch, generally over the whole willow. At the red maple I tapped, I see the sap still running and wetting the whole side of the tree. Yet it is as sweet and thick as molasses, and the twigs and bugs look as if black and polished. No doubt the bees and other insects frequent the maples now. I thought I heard the hum of a bee, but perhaps it was a railroad whistle on the Lowell Railroad. And today is the birthday of the Dutch phytopathologist Christine Johanna Bauschmann, who was born on this day, March 22nd, in 1900. Christine worked on the all-female team of scientists tackling Dutch elm disease, which was led by the great botanist Johanna Westerdijk. Christine is remembered for her dedication to the topic of Dutch elm disease, and she was the first scientist from her team to confirm that the fungus Graphium ulmi was the cause for the disease in North America. Christine died young at the age of 36 after complications from a surgery. The following year, she was remembered by her peers who named the first resistant elm tree clone in her honor. It's time for Unearthed Words. In Unearthed Words, today's words come to us from the English poet Thomas Carey in honor of the anniversary of his death on this day, March 22nd, in 1640. Thomas was part of the Cavalier group of Caroline poets, and he wrote a popular poem called The Spring. Here's an excerpt. The earth hath lost her snow-white robes, and now no more frost candies the grass or casts an icy cream upon the silver lake or crystal stream. But the warm sun thaws the benumbed earth and makes it tender, gives a sacred birth to the dead swallow, wakes in hollow tree the drowsy cuckoo and the humble bee. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, 
Garden Time by W.S. Merwin. This book came out in 2016, and the author William Merwin wrote this book during a time in his life when he was losing his eyesight. And when his eyes failed him, he actually dictated his poems to his wife, Paula. When I heard of this, I immediately thought of the great garden couple, Jane Loudon, as she was helping her husband, John Claudius Loudon, in the final years of his life. Now, back in 2010, William Merwin and his wife Paula co-founded the Merwin Conservancy at his home in Maui. William used the 19 protected acres surrounding his home to cultivate 400 different species of tropical trees and many of the world's rarest palm trees. William bought the property in 1977, and every day he planted a tree. Back in 2019, William's story was outlined in an excellent opinion piece that was featured in the New York Times. William Merwin served as Poet Laureate of the United States, and he received every major literary accolade, including two Pulitzer Prizes. And I think that William's poems speak to a gardener's heart. William once wrote, Come back, believer in shade, believer in silence and elegance, believer in ferns, believer in patience, believer in the rain. And here's my favorite William Merwin quote. On the last day of the world, I would want to plant a tree. William's book, Garden Time, is 96 pages of inspiring verse. You can get a copy of Garden Time by W.S. Merwin and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $8. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, March 22nd in 1822, that the New York Horticultural Society was founded. The NYHS was the first horticultural society in the nation, and it managed to survive until it fizzled out in the mid to late 1800s. While the Massachusetts and the Pennsylvania Hort Societies flourished, the New York Horticultural Society faltered. In 1837, a frustrated member of the group wrote a letter to the editor of the magazine of Horticulture and Botany, complaining that the society's declining membership was due to the city's decline in morality and an overwhelming focus on prosperity, and the impact was that people couldn't, quote, afford to patronize a horticultural exhibition. In reality, the society had fallen victim to the economic downturn of the 1830s and was grieving the death of a leading member, the great botanist David Hossack. David had elevated the organization, making it an elite place for horticultural education and prestige. But without David, wealthy members fell away, and the organization struggled for relevancy. Over and over again, this group tried and failed to garner enough support to build a botanical garden in the city of New York. Finally, in the 1890s, a new movement led by the Britons, Nathaniel and Elizabeth. The husband and wife botanical team successfully garnered enough attention and support, and their effort ultimately led to the creation of the New York Botanical Garden. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember... 
for a happy, healthy life. Garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter, and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.